Hi, I'm Pete, and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. It's getting to be the fly time of year. Everybody's favorite subject is flies, and I have a drastically different experiment to try this year versus last year. In this video, I wanna do a data dump on fly control, the types of flies that affect cattle here where we live in the Northeast. All the different fly control methods I can think of with pros and cons for each relating to our specific circumstances. And finally, what our integrated pest management plan for this summer will be. Sounds exciting, right? IPMs, flies. I'll try to make it as exciting as I can. First, let's look at our cast of villains. You gotta know your enemy, right? We have three main types of flies that affect cattle here and the first is the stable fly i'll put up pictures of each stable flies are about the size of a house fly but they're dark gray and they have dark irregular spots on their abdomens their proboscis which is the thing that sticks out from their mouth protrudes bayonet like in front of the head and they feed on blood mostly on the they'll park on the legs of cattle and suck blood from the cattle, bite and suck blood. And you know your cattle have got them if they're stomping their feet a lot and switching their tails back and forth to avoid the flies biting. These flies, unlike a lot of flies, tend to breed more in rotting hay than anything else. And late summer is their worst time. We're a little early for them right now. I guess they take a while to really ramp up in their breeding production. So these are the kind of flies you find around bunk feeders, things, places where damp hay and straw are, those kinds of composty kind of things, not so much in cow patties. Number two, face flies. Everybody sees those on cattle, pretty common. They look like a house fly, just like a house fly, and they'll congregate around the cattle's eyes and sometimes on wounds, if a cattle cat has a wound or a sore spot, they feed on those secretions, the mucus around the eyes, whatever's oozing from the wound, yucky stuff but they don't bite different from the other flies. The worst thing about this fly, aside from it annoying the cattle endlessly, is that they can pick up and carry and transmit pink eye. Now for my favorite fly, this is the villain of villains in the fly rogue gallery, the horn fly. The horn fly is smaller than a house fly. It bites and feeds on blood, and it can do that 24 to 38 times per day. That's how many meals it gets per day, 24 to 38. And it is a fast-breeding little sucker. It can go from egg to reproduction age in 10 to 20 days, many, many generations in the summer. The eggs are laid in, in the pupae or the maggots are in cow patties. That's how they reproduce. You see them mostly on the shoulders, back, and the sides of the cattle versus, say, the face fly, which is usually around the mucousy areas of the face. This is the nasty one. In fact, I think that the folks who, who gave it its Latin name, you know, the proper name for the insect, knew how nasty it was because its Latin name is Hematobia irritans irritans. They couldn't just say irritans once, had to be twice. Now that we know who our enemy is and what their habits are, we can use that knowledge to find a way to control them. And now I'm going to rattle down all of the methods I know for controlling flies. And there is a whole bunch, real quick. Attracting and catching flies, like I did last year, jars and fly paper. You can use fly repellents, garlic salt, vinegar in their water. There's tons of different options for those. You can spray the cattle with insecticides. Ours run away from the spray, but you could try it. You can use porons, which pour down the center of their back and it lingers there and it kills the flies on contact. Another insecticide, you can use back rubs, which are hanging things. The cattle walk under them and there's insecticide in them and that helps kill the flies when they land on the cattle later on. You can use ear tags that have insecticide embedded in them and they're, it's a long lasting version. So you put a tag in both sides. When the cattle groom themselves and rub those ear tags on their coat, then it spreads that insecticide on their coat. Now with these tags, you gotta make sure to put them on at the right time because they have a limited lifespan. So you wanna hit them right at the beginning of fly season and not earlier. Next, systemic insecticides. We tried these. I didn't like them very much. These are things you feed to the cattle, and most commonly it's a part of their mineral supplement. And what it does is it interrupts the life cycle of the fly. So with the particular one we used, the cattle ate it up in their mineral, and then it was in their cow patties, and it made the fly eggs infertile. 
whatever was in that stuff so that the flies did not reproduce in the cow patties. What we found out is it interrupted the life cycle of lots of other decomposers besides flies. We wound up with like rubber hockey puck <laughs> cow patties that didn't <laughs> rot like they should. Next thing, parasitic wasps. Lots of talk about them. Everybody thinks that's the greatest idea since sliced bread. You, you buy these eggs online, parasitic, parasitic wasps eggs. You plant them around in the cow patties where the cows loaf and out in the pasture. You got to reseed the eggs once a month or so in the summer. They're expensive. I looked at treating our herd with the parasitic wasp solution and it was six to $800 per season. I said, there goes my profit margin. Poultry following the cattle. This is an old popular one. I think Joel Saladin probably popularized this where you bring your chickens, in our case, onto the pastures that your cattle were on four days after the cattle come off them, just in time for those fly eggs to hatch and the chickens spread apart the patties and eat up the fly maggots. What's not talked about this solution too much is you need a balance between your different types of livestock. So with our 30 head of cattle, we would have to go back to mob grazing and moving them every day for this solution to work. In that situation, they graze about 6,000 square foot per day in prime growing conditions, weather, or uh, a paddock that's about 30 foot wide and 200 foot long. So in order for us to use this solution, Hillary and I would have to go out every morning and move the chicken fence to the next paddock probably be electronet fencing, 30 foot by 200 foot. That's a massive endeavor. We would need more chickens than what we have now to cover that area. We'd probably need around 500 minimum laying hens to cover that large area. It's a great solution. It's just not practical in our case. We just don't have the time to do that every day. Next, bird housing. Build bird houses all over the place. Yeah, I get people that tell me that all the time. We have bird habitat all around our fields, hedgerows, forest, lots of swallows when I'm cutting hay. I have really never even, I've never seen this as a valid solution. Yes, swallows do eat a ton of flies. Swallows are usually active in the morning and evening from my observations, and I just can't see a situation where I could put up enough birdhouses to control the flies. It just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I know people will disagree with that, and that's fine. Next solution, eliminate the flies breeding grounds. So I gave you the breeding grounds for the flies, wet hay, compost, muddy areas, manure areas, manure paddies, do all you can to eliminate those areas. That certainly is a valid form of control, just like the old Panama Canal approach to controlling malaria, right? The, the person that figured it out went back to the source of the mosquitoes, which is the creeks where they hatch. His particular method probably wouldn't be very acceptable today where he actually put oil drums over every creek that fed into the, where they were digging the canal that dripped oil into the creeks and formed a surface film on the creeks so that the mosquitoes couldn't lay eggs on that surface film. Environmentally, not very friendly, but it saved a lot of people's lives. So I guess you gotta balance things. The last option or control strategy, maybe it's not a control strategy, is to just do nothing which is what we did for years and years. It was only when I got on YouTube that people started saying, oh my gosh, look at the flies on your cattle, and I started seeing it from the outside. I'm not sure if I can quantify the effects of flies on our cattle. They're certainly a nuisance. As far as weight gain, I don't know how much it's reducing it. Is it worth the money that you spend and the time you spend with all these things? I'm not sure, but I'm willing to give it a try. By my count, there were 12 different options on my list, and that included doing nothing. How do you go through all those options and decide which is best for you? Well, I did it by the process of elimination. There are certain things I'm just not comfortable with, certain things that are too much work. So let's take a look. Attracting and catching flies like I did last year, I don't think that worked out very well. In fact, I think I was attracting flies from further than our farm, and I just did not see it reducing the load. It just seemed like a lot of kind of useless work. And to really go whole hog on that, I would have to put up those jar traps and the dozens, put fly paper, yards and yards of fly paper. I would have to go nuts with it. So I'm, not, I'm really not interested in doing that. Second, fly repellents, garlic salt. We used garlic salt last year. I don't know if it worked or not. I think it's a worthwhile thing to try. There's not a lot to invest in it. Vinegar in the water, all that stuff, 
I don't know. My opinion on such things is a little bit um, pessimistic, I guess I would say. Thirdly, spraying cattle with insecticides and fourthly, pouring stuff on the backs of the cattle. Our cattle just won't tolerate that. As soon as they see that bottle coming, they run. So that's not even on the table for me. Ear tags. We're not set up to be able to do ear tags. Yes, we have a head gate, but we don't have any chute system or anything like that. It would be a massive undertaking for Hillary and I to tag all the cattle, so that one's off the table. Systemic insecticides, cattle feed through, you know, mineral goes through the cat. I already expressed all of my concerns about that. That is kind of like the last option for me. I would never feed anything that where the solution was greater than the problem. You know, killing all the decomposers in the cow patties is not worth it. I'd rather have flies than do all that damage. Poultry following the cattle, not practical. Birdhouses, pie in the sky, I think. Preventing areas where they breed. Now that's something that can be done with not that much effort. And back rubs, that brought me to back rubs as one thing that was the least of evils, I guess you would say. Let's get started. This is a 10 foot long back rubber, which is just a real spongy absorbent material here inside with ropes at both ends. Post number two, 10 foot apart. We got quite a set of inspectors here. <laughs> I'm putting in a guy wire so that the weight of the rub won't pull on this light little T-post as badly. And I view this as a temporary solution. We're trying to see what works here. So if it works, we'll replace it with something sturdier. Here's our back rub all complete. We hung it a little higher than we thought we needed just so the cattle can get used to it and then this post is held up by tension from these fence wires on this side. And then on this side we have our diagonal wire. And we covered that with a slitted garden hose to keep it from grounding out here. We had to block off this edge here to make sure that this was the only way they could get in. The idea here is you want to locate it where the cattle are coming in and out multiple times a day. And this is the grove of course. Whenever they come in from the fields they'll have to go through this opening to get to water and to mineral into shade. Passing under the back rub and getting fly treatment. We're cleaning up our supplies and they're checking it out. Nobody's gone through yet. Give it a sniff. You guys are having second thoughts, aren't you? They're gonna need to get used to it, but one went through. He says, well, I'm still alive. I think you other guys can come. Now it's time to mix up the solution that goes on the back rubber, and this is permethrin. This is 10% permethrin. It's 20 bucks for a quart is what I paid. And it's an insecticide. I'm gonna mix up five gallons of this stuff, so it takes eight ounces of this permethrin per five gallons. And then I had to make another difficult decision. I, when folks would tell me, oh, just use diesel oil or diesel fuel to, you got to have something to keep the stuff from evaporating. It can't be, you know, mixed with water or else it's going to dry up real fast. I would say diesel fuel. I'm not allowing the cattle to come in contact with diesel fuel. Well, we were going to use mineral oil because I thought that's a good alternative. We went and looked at mineral oil. It was $30 a gallon and I need two gallons minimum just to coat this thing for the first time. It's going to need to be recoated every once in a while. It's a matter of economics. So I'm using diesel fuel. Probably don't matter that much, but I'm going to stir it up with a broom handle. And that's what the stuff looks like. Fairly clear. Not a whole lot of permethrin in terms of volume. Now I'm going to do my best to coat this evenly and put about two gallons on it, which is what the directions said. And now I guess we just wait and see the cattle are laying out there in the field. Sooner or later they're going to come in and they'll make their way through this, I'm sure. In the beginning of the video I mentioned integrated pest management IPM and having a plan. 
and the back rub that we put in is only one of three things designed to kind of cover all aspects of fly control. The second part is warding the flies away with garlic salt, which we'll be adding to our mineral feeder, in addition to the kelp that we feed all summer long. And the third part is changing the way we handle and pile manure, which usually happens right here. In the summertime, as we take manure out of the barn, finish the winter bedding packs, clean out the chicken coops and things, we'll start having a pile here to compost. But the problem is, this is a fly breeding ground right here, and it's only a few hundred feet from where the cattle lounge in the grove. This third part of the plan is a lot like what happened at the Panama Canal. The best way to keep flies down is to prevent them from breeding at all. So if we take away that manure pile that was so close to the grove and we put it over here on the north end of the barn, which is at least twice as far from the cattle, maybe a little more than twice as far, then we're going to cut down on that back and forth the cattle to the flies from the hatching a bit. But one of the biggest things I think that's going to affect the way flies breed on this pile is we plan on covering it. We're going to get a big tarp or a, a silage pit cover and cover that pile during the summer so that it, it dries out, it gets warmer in the pile, and larvae won't be able to survive in there. I guess I got to be honest with you. This is something that Hillary and I struggled with a lot when we looked at all the potential solutions and the ramifications of each. This is the one that looked the best, but it kind of flies in the face of the way I've done things for a lot of the farm where we focus on natural solutions and I don't know, this seems like the, nu the nuclear option to me. But when I looked at the more naturalistic solutions I just didn't see any that were potent enough to deal with the problem and if you can knock back the fly population at its inception in the beginning of the season you make a big debt early and it, it has more than its relative effect later on in the season because the population you know it's like a geometric progression it's huge so we're going to try it. You know, life is about compromises sometimes. It's nice to be idealistic, and I've talked about this. <laughs> idealistic farming is an awful hard thing to make a living off of because your ideals get in the way a lot. So I'm doing what I need to do, and I hope that you're okay with that. It, it worries me. So I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time.